Thank you. Um, I'm Brad Klingenberg. Um, I'll ask you to bear with me. I've had a cold recently and still getting my voice back. Um, so I lead the styling algorithms team at Stitch Fix, and I thought today I'd shake things up a little bit and talk about women's fashion. So Stitch Fix is a personal styling service for women, and at Stitch Fix, we combine algorithmic predictions about what we think our clients are going to like with human curation to find the perfect items for our clients. And so today, I'll be talking about some practical lessons related to having humans in the loop when doing machine learning. And so in particular, by having humans in the loop, I mean having human judgment actively part of the process that combined with statistical predictions that's used in a production setting. And just as a preview, I'll share that the, the theme is going to be, it works very well, but it's complicated. And in particular, today I'll talk about three lessons related to having humans in the loop. So the first is that when you introduce humans, there's going to be more than one way to measure success. The second is that you have to really think carefully about what it is that you're predicting. And finally, unlike machines, humans can say no. And this can really complicate running experiments. So before we get to the particular lessons, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Stitch Fix is and the way that we use humans there. And then I'll share some lessons from our experience working with humans in the loop. So as I mentioned, Stitch, Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service. And the way it works as a client is that you sign up, you go to our website, you tell us about your preferences, your, your sizes, your styles that you like. We're going to pick five things to send to you. And the key is that we're going to pick those things. It's not traditional e-commerce where the client is picking things for herself. Um, but we're actually going to pick, pick them for her, on acting on her behalf as a personal stylist. We'll send them to her. She tries them on at home. She keeps what she likes and sends back what she doesn't. And so in a little more detail, uh, the, the clients, when they sign up, will tell us all about how they like their clothes to fit, the different sizes that they have. They'll rate some images to tell us about their, their style preferences. And so we collect a lot of great information about our clients that way. Stitch Fix, much like a traditional retailer, buys and holds its own inventory. So we have a large fixed set of inventory. And you can think about the problem as being fundamentally a matching problem. So given a client who's requested a shipment and a set of available inventory, what are the things that we should send to her that are most likely to make her happy? And then we send the items to the client, and we pay um, shipping both ways. So if you think about the product, you can really think of recommendations as being what's offered to our client. And Stitch Fix is really betting on its recommendations in an almost literal sense. So there's a lot of costs to getting it wrong. We, of course, disappoint our clients, but we have to pay shipping. So it's really important that we do a good job selecting things that our clients are going to love. And the way that we do this is through a combination of statistical modeling and recommendation systems, but then also active human curation and, and introducing human judgment. And so in particular, there's two stages to this process. The first is looking at the data that we have and making predictions about what we think our clients are going to like. And broadly speaking, we have three types of data. So we have explicit information about our clients that they tell us about themselves when they sign up. So again, their sizes and style preferences. We have explicit information about our inventory. So when we buy things, we have our fashion experts create a bunch of structured attributes about the material, how it feels, what, what color it is, and in a lot of great detail. So we have st structured attributes about our inventory. And then most interestingly, we have feedback data. Um, so whenever somebody gets a fix, which is what we call a shipment, we're going to get implicit feedback by what they decide to keep. We're also going to get explicit feedback. People answer structured questions saying something is too large or too small, maybe it's too expensive, um, along with reform text. And so we can take all of these sources of information and put them together, and when a particular client requests a fix, we can make a prediction about what in our inventory will be a good match for her. And so we work on a variety of algorithms and uh, statistical prediction methods to, to try to, to make the best predictions that we can with the data that we have. The second stage is to take these predictions and then to have a human stylist review them. So Stitch Fix has many stylists. Their Stitch Fix employees um, typically worked in fashion, have a have passion for picking things out for people. And their job is to take the recommendations that were generated algorithmically 
and then to select the final five things that are right for the client. And this stage brings a number of huge advantages. So first of all, humans are really, really good at working with things like unstructured data. So our clients can write a request note saying, I'm going to a wedding, please send me something, you know, that is great for a formal occasion. You could try to do something like natural language processing on a request like that, but a human is going to be better. We also have some unstructured data that our clients can give us. So when people sign up, they have the option to link to a Pinterest board where they can pin images of things they think represent their style. Again, you could try to use computer vision to understand that, um, but a human you know, scanning in even just a minute can get a real holistic sense of somebody's style. So humans really add a lot to the process. They also make the life of an algorithm developer a lot easier. Um, essentially, if you make a particularly bad recommendation, there's still a human in the loop to, to save the day and say, no, no, I don't think that's a good choice for the client. So we have this two-stage process. And it's really interesting to think about what this means for developing algorithms and the way that we measure them. And this brings me to the first lesson, which is that when you introduce humans to the loop, there's going to be more than one way to measure success. So in a traditional statistical problem or recommendation setting, you'll have a model, and you'll make recommendations or predictions, and then you'll see what happens. So in the case of Stitch Fix, we'll ship something to somebody. We might have thought that she'd like it. We might have thought that she'd hate it. Usually we then send things we think they'll like. Um, and then we'll find out what happens. So this, this is nice direct feedback that you can use to iterate and make algorithms better and better. It also supports two very common ways of measuring the performance of algorithms. So we can think about their end impact on the business. So at Stitch Fix, how, do they, how well do they work? How happy are clients? Are we good at getting things to them that they like? You can also think about the statistical quality of whatever method you're using to make the recommendation. So if there's a model behind it, if you're predicting probabilities, you can think about the statistical accuracy of, of those models and use this feedback to iterate on both of those things. So this is great and a nice kind of particularly simple setup. Um, when you introduce humans to the loop, it gets a little more complicated. So as I described, we have at Stitch Fix this two-stage process where first we make recommendations based on data, and then we have our human stylist curate those recommendations. And so this means that only things that actually get sent to clients are the things that are selected by the stylist. And so we then get this extra layer of feedback. So when we make a recommendation through an algorithm, it doesn't actually go straight to a client. Um, so we don't always get to receive feedback for everything that we've recommended, um, but we also get to see which among the things that we've recommended the stylist ultimately chose. And so this extra layer of feedback is very interesting in itself to tell you about the performance of your algorithmic predictions, but also offers another way of viewing the success of those algorithms in the first place. And so in particular, we're usually interested in optimizing the end result. So at Stitch Fix, that means making our clients happy. We want them to love the things that we send them. But at the same time, this extra feedback loop introduces new objective functions um, that can be, can be very important. And so, for example, if you imagined a couple different algorithms or a family of algorithms that had about the same results at the end of the day, so they all made clients equally happy, we would probably prefer algorithms that have the following properties. So we'd prefer things that in increase agreement between our machine predictions and the human selection and reduce the need for searching. So it would be pretty dispiriting if you worked really hard on a recommendation algorithm and you present it to stylists and say, oh no, that's terrible, I'm not going to send that to her, and always ignore it. You'd hope that your recommendations are useful and are heated, um, and so this really comes down to wanting to make credible and useful recommendations. And one way of measuring whether this is happening is to look at how the stylists interact with the recommendations that we're making. Similarly, we want to make recommendations that make the stylists better at what they do. Um, so these are human employees. We want, we want them to be efficient. And what we're aiming for is this process of effortless curation, where the things that we're recommending are so good that the human can say, oh yeah, that, that, that looks great, and they can put it together with the, the rest of the decision, the rest of the factors in their decision about what to send, but we want it to be really easy. And likewise, you know, as human employees, we, we, we train stylists, we invest in them, and we want them to stay with the company and love their jobs. And one way 
one thing that we really care about is them having a good experience as a stylist. So as a user or consumer of these recommendations, we want their experience to be a good one. And that means making fewer bad or annoying recommendations. So if I loved a particularly awful polka dot dress and recommended it for every single client, that'd be really annoying. And we, we want to make sure that we don't do things like that. And so in general, we want to make things that are useful for human consumption. And that, that is not always a top level goal in, in recommendation systems. And in general, addressing all of these goals means that we're going to have to log and analyze what I'll call selection data. So if we were just interested in what's successful with clients, we can just essentially look at the, the purchase history of our clients, the history of what was sent to them and the feedback that we got. Looking at the selection data from Stylus is more difficult for several reasons. So one is that the data tends to be much, much larger. So instead of considering just the five things that are sent to a client, we now want to consider the superset of things that was available to the stylist and understand how they interacted with the recommendations that we made. Along those lines, we're going to need to think about the presentation of those results to the stylist and what impact that might have had on their decisions. So this is getting very similar to what you might do in search engine research, where if you have something that's given uh, the, the top billing on a search results page, it's probably going to be selected more often simply by virtue of having been at the top of the page. And so you have to start thinking about modeling presentation effects. And in general, it's just a much more complicated problem than looking at was this, this item purchased when sent to a client. But despite the, the increased difficulty, it's, it's well worth the endeavor. So this brings me to the second lesson, which is that you have to think really carefully about what you're predicting. And so this sounds like something that should always be true, but I think it's especially true when you have the situation where you have many different objective functions that you care about. So if you were presented the problem of designing an algorithm for stitch fix, an initial first pass might be to ignore the fact that we have humans in the loop in the, at all and just say, I'll look at historically how have items done with clients when they, they were sent out. And this is really convenient. So it sidesteps the complexities of the selection problem that we just talked about. So needing to construct this superset of things that were available to be selected. And it's a much simpler problem. It's very kind of a traditional supervised machine learning problem. And the historical data is just going to be five items that we've sent to all our clients. So it's going to be manageable in size. And um, it's pretty interesting. But the problem is that the fact that we have this extra layer of selection is actually quite important. Um, and you can, you can easily lead yourself astray by ignoring it. So for example, um, suppose we have a client who tells us on the initial survey that she doesn't like to flaunt her arms. So we wouldn't send her something like a tank top or a dress with no sleeves. Well, so the stylist, when searching through inventory, um, is probably going to listen to this request. And they're going to say, OK, well, I'm not going to send her something that would flaunt her arms. And this is absolutely the right thing to do. This is going to be something that is well serves the client. We're going to give them something that she's going to like. And um, it is absolutely the right decision for the stylist to make. But by making that decision, the stylist might actually censor the data. So if we were to send things randomly to clients, we'd, we would observe that it's a bad idea to send them things that violate these preferences. But if you have a stylist who's in the middle and never allows those things to be sent, we'll never actually even observe what would happen if we sent something that violated those constraints. And because of that, if you just sit down and train a model, there's going to be no evidence to support a feature um, or a preference in an algorithm for things that, that match these client preferences. And so the, the moral here is that selection can introduce bias into your data. And that bias can be very extreme, all the way to even censoring certain failure modes that are prevented by, by the human stylus. So we can take a step back and say, OK, well, so ignoring selection wasn't a good idea. Maybe selection is actually what I want to predict. Maybe I should be taking this feedback from the first, the first feedback loop and make predictions about what I think stylists are actually going to want to send to clients. And this you know, is a reasonable thing to try. But it also has some drawbacks. So the first and most important is that selection is not really success. So we want to send things to our clients that they're going to love. That's the ultimate goal. Recommending things that the stylist is going to want to choose might be related to that goal, but it's not really the same. And so it feels a little worrying to, to start optimizing away from our, our final goal. Another drawback to this approach is that there's a much more direct feedback loop with the presentation effect that I mentioned earlier. 
If we recommend something because it's being selected and then put it at the top of the list because it was being selected, it's going to be selected more. You're going to have to be really careful about the kind of direct feedback from um, predicting selection. So what to do? Well, in practice, you should probably consider both. And in fact, models for selection or models for success given selection are both incredibly useful. And they're especially interesting in the cases where they disagree. And so I'll, I'll offer two examples of when that might happen. So let's suppose that we made a really bad recommendation. So a client says, I need an outfit for a glamorous night out. So we run our styling algorithm and get some results, and we present them to the stylist. So we have maybe two good choices and one bad choice. So the stylist here might say, well, that first item on the left was not appropriate for this, this client, so I'm not going to send it. And here, the stylist was disagreeing with the recommendations, and it was a good thing for the client. And so this is interesting. Maybe we need to fix that algorithm. So again, kind of looking at where these two predictions depart from one another is usually very informative. But it's not always good. In fact, you can, you can easily find cases where it's bad when they disagree. So an example there would be, in some cases, we can predict with quite a bit of confidence that something would be very successful with a client. And we can recommend it to a stylist, but they might not choose it. They might not be convinced or understand why it's going to be successful with a client. And oftentimes, this has to do with the fact that we have to make recommendations for humans. And so a really important aspect of that is making kind of credible, interpretable, transparent recommendations. And so if we were to share, for example, with the stylist, well, I think she's really going to buy this top because of her recent purchase, or that it's really aligned with the style of other things that she's loved, we might be able to convince them. And so when we sometimes make recommendations that aren't heeded by stylists, it can really often come back down to transparency. And this is, this is a really interesting aspect of making predictions for humans, where interpretable models and being able to say why, not just what, is actually really important. So my, my third and final lesson will be that unlike machines, humans can say no. And this can introduce a lot of complexity into running experiments. So as a simple example, Suppose that I had a really misguided policy, so we're going to follow Brad's fashion advice and say that, okay, new rule, every single shipment we send has to have polka dots in it. Every box has to have polka dots. So probably a terrible idea, but you know, that's what A-B tests are for, so let's find out what happens. So one way we could, we could go about testing this would be to partition our set of styles into two groups, a control and a test cell. Have the control cell do things the normal way, have the test cell say you have to send polka dots, it's the new rule. Well, what we'd like to discover is that this is a bad idea. But the problem is that the stylists have some independent judgment, and they might not always comply um, with, with suggestions. So for example, if a, a stylist in the, the, the test cell has a client for whom they know a polka dot item is an extremely bad choice, they'll probably just not send it to that client. And again, they're doing the right thing. They're acting in the client's interest, but it's going to really complicate the data that you have. And so, in effect, by saying, well, well, you know, for this client, I know in particular, she's not going to like polka dots, so I'm not going to do it for her. What they've effectively done is taken a shipment that was in the control cell and moved it, or excuse me, in the test cell and moved it back to the control cell. And so you can obscure completely the effect that you're trying to measure. So the fact that this is a bad idea can be entirely lost. So what can you do about this? Well, so it turns out that humans exhibit this behavior all the time. So if you look at clinical trials um, and medicines that people are given, they very often will just say, no, I'm not going to take that drug. And they might say it in a way that's correlated with the outcome of the experiment. And so this is something that's been intensively studied um, in, 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 in medicine and social research. And so there's a lot of great resources um, for thinking about non-compliance that is selectively um, or selective compliance in experiments. So, so just briefly, I, just to leave you with the lessons, having humans in the loop is wonderful. They, they bring in a lot of extra information. They really help make good decisions. And it makes the life of people developing algorithms easier in a lot of ways. But it also brings a lot of complexity. And so if you're thinking about a machine learning system with an active human component, you need to think about how you want to measure success, what you're really interested in predicting, and to be really careful when you're doing experiments to make sure that people are not selectively non-compliant. Thank you. Very <laughs>